Opposition politician Ilya Yashin believed that his criticism of the war would sound louder and be more convincing if he stayed in Russia. So he did. His criticism was heard, and the government scrambled to silence him. And the most high-profile case of a Russian dissident being jailed for opposing the invasion of Ukraine, a court in Moscow has found Yashin guilty of spreading false information about the Russian military in Ukraine. Yashin had described the killings of civilians in Bucha by Russian forces as a massacre. The court decided to find Ilya Valerievich Yashin guilty of committing a crime under criminal code of the Russian Federation and imposed a sentence of imprisonment for eight years and six months in a standard correctional colony. Don't worry, anyone who thinks Putin's going to rule for eight years is being very optimistic. International human rights groups have denounced the decision as a mockery of justice. Yashin called on Russian President Vladimir Putin to admit the war in Ukraine was wrong, withdraw Russian troops and seek talks. Putin, when asked about the verdict, first pretended not to know who Yashin was and then said he wouldn't question the court's decision. Interference in the activities of the courts is absolutely unacceptable. I consider it inappropriate to question the decision of the court. There are certain statutory rights to protect citizens as they would like to be protected. It is possible to go to a higher court. Mr. Yashin's lawyers know what to do. A one man who certainly thought it pertinent to question the decision of the court was the also jailed Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. This is how he reacted to the trial's outcome on Twitter. He said, another shameless and lawless verdict by Putin's court will not silence Ilya and should not intimidate the honest people of Russia. This is yet another reason why we have to keep fighting and I have no doubt we will ultimately win. Let's look at this case a little closer and bring in our Russian affairs analyst, Konstantin Egad. He joins us from Vilnius in Lithuania. Konstantin, this is the highest profile opposition figure to be sentenced in Russia since the war broke out. Tell us more about Ilya Yashin and his alleged crime. Well, I have, I have the honor of knowing him personally since quite a long time. Ilya uh, was, uh, since a long time, an opposition activist, organizer, uh, someone who took very active part in the um, protests in 2011, 2012, of which were probably the biggest anti-Putin protests ever. Uh, he also uh, is distinguished by two things. Uh, firstly, he was one of those early Russian opposition figures who unequivocally condemned uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine 2014, and with the late um, assassinated uh, leader, uh, opposition leader, former Vice Premier Boris Nemtsov, he published a, probably the first Russian kind of white paper on the uh, on this war and on Putin's crimes in Ukraine. And the second interesting feature that for several years uh, he was actually a very rare thing, an opposition politician who was in charge of a real thing. He was elected as head of uh, one of uh, small municipalities that, um, uh, of which uh, Moscow consists. Moscow is like 20 million people, so mm -hmm. it has a lot of subdivisions. And he worked there for some time, actually gaining some recognition from, uh, from, from the populace, but um, had to leave it under the Kremlin pressure. Yashin made a conscious decision to stay in Russia because he believed that anti-war voices would sound louder if they came from within the country. Do you believe that to be true? Well, I interviewed him last year uh, for, actually for DW, for the uh, Russian service. And indeed, he thought that there is um, a, a potential, uh, uh, how would say, change on the horizon. Uh, and at that time, though, we, of course, could not foresee uh, what's going to happen in Ukraine. But yes, he was always adamant that he's going to stay and that he's going to confront Putin inside Russia. That was his principal position, asked him several times. Can he really make a bigger impact now being imprisoned on the charges that he's going to spend years and years in prison for? Or um, 
is is the diaspora that's been driven out of Russia out of fear for these kinds of consequences really more influential at this point? You know, you cannot predict. Um, every every epoch, every historical um, time has, has, has its own peculiarities. So I can't say. What I want to say is that, of course, for Ilya Yashin and for Alexei Navalny and for another opposition politician, Vladimir Karamurza, who is probably soon going to be put on trial, this was very much a principal decision to stay inside the country, whether they will have a big political future or not, uh, I think it's very cynical to debate it because, frankly speaking, you are sacrificing years of your life, if not actually your life, because Russian prison is not a sanatorium, uh, for something that's very vague. I think it's a very principled position. I think it is respected by many people. And by the way, I think by a lot of Yashins and Navalny's and Karamurza's enemies. Uh, but um, what will be the end result politically, I can't say. As of now, I think Russian emigration, Russian diaspora, as you called it correctly, uh, is trying to come to terms with the fact that it is now outside of Russia. It tries to organize. It tries to find new voice and to find, tries to find new ideas. That takes always, it always takes time. Uh, frankly speaking, I think that in the age of mass communication, there is a much better chance of Russian opposition, um, Russian diaspora having an impact inside Russia because of technologies that, for example, the first wave of Russian immigration, the 20s, those who ran from the communists, from the Bolsheviks, uh, did not have at their disposal. Mm. Let's Look into the crystal ball here for a second. Yashin seemed extraordinarily upbeat in court um, and quite defiant. After receiving his sentence, he said, don't worry, anyone who thinks Putin is going to rule for eight more years is being very optimistic. Uh, do you think he might be right? Well, I think what I can say, well, first of all, Ilya is always very cheerful, uh, very focused, and he would have never let himself, uh, kind of his, 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 um, to show some despair uh, uh, in court, because I don't think he has it. I think that, that that's who he is. Uh, that's what we've seen. But with regard to the crystal ball, well, I'm not a great gazer, frankly speaking. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, what I can say for sure is that with this full-scale invasion of 24th of February this year, Putin significantly shortened he stay in power. In theory, he can stay as president officially until 2036. Just imagine it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do not think it will be that long. How Putin's regimes will will how Putin's regime will go? That I can't predict, and no one can predict. Anyone who says I know that it's going to be tomorrow, I know it's going to be in five years, is actually either bluffing or a provocateur. Yeah. Konstantin, there was more news coming out of Russia today with an uh, quite a usually talkative President Putin. He commented on remarks former German Chancellor Angela Merkel made in an interview that the Minsk agreements had been an attempt to give Ukraine time to build up its defenses. Let's listen to some of what he had to say and then get right back to you. To be honest, it was completely unexpected for me. This is disappointing. Frankly, I did not expect to hear this from the former German Chancellor because I have always assumed that the leadership of Germany is sincere with us. It turned out they lied to us too, and the point was only to pump up Ukraine with weapons and prepare for hostilities. Well, we see it. Apparently we got our bearings too late, to be honest. Maybe we should have started earlier. Our Russian affairs analyst, Konstantin Egad, is still with us. Konstantin Putin says he's surprised and disappointed by what essentially amounts to people calling his bluff. What do you make of this? Poor Putin. Everyone always deceives him. That's the why. <laughs> uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Of course, uh, uh, Putin understood, and everyone understood at the time, that the Minsk agreements were a, a way, of course, to save Ukraine from a military debacle, and in this respect, they, of course, succeeded. Uh, I think that Putin wanted to use the Minsk agreements as a kind of pressure point, but he never succeeded, because, frankly speaking, uh, in the West, people did understand that, first of all, Ukraine will not budge. Uh, what we find in this in, in this quote and this this whatever 30 40 seconds that Putin said is a very typical 
um, view that he, I think, sincerely espouses is that Ukraine is somehow completely devoid of any kind of political will, political agency, if you wish, is just a marionette, is just a puppet of the Western states who, I mean, stop the war and then start popping it up with weapons. Uh, I actually think that uh, on the subconscious level, he believes that that's, that that's the case. And uh, of course, from that, uh, everything else flows that, okay, Putin is just defending himself. Putin is just defending Russia. The problem is that this uh, propaganda, this type of messaging has been ongoing for a long, long, long time uh, on Russian state media. And frankly speaking, quite a lot of people um, adopted it, accepted it, and now we live with it. That's why, to a large extent, you do not have and will not have for quite a long time, I think, that's my personal view, any kind of major anti-war and anti-Putin movement inside Russia, because lots of people are uh, basically, to use the word, bamboozled uh, by this messaging, and others really want to be left alone. So. Putin can say whatever he wants. There is no one actually, because Russia is not a democracy, uh, no one to basically take him to account for what he mm. says. So he can say one thing today, another thing tomorrow. We only have about a minute left, but I do want to ask you about something that, that he said there. He says maybe we should have started earlier. Doesn't that prove that a diplomatic solution in line with the Minsk agreement was never in his interest? Yes, I'm absolutely certain. He always wanted to continue this war. He always knew he's going to go forward. When and how, that's a different matter. Of course, if Zelensky surrendered and says, As according to the Minsk agreements, I'm giving you everything you want, Vladimir Vladimirovich, then probably there would have been no war. But there was no chance that any Ukrainian president would do that. Konstantin Egad, our Russian affairs analyst, joining us today with very interesting insights from Vilnius in Lithuania. Thank you so much. Thank you.